Welcome to another episode of Operation 3731, the weekly video series from First Baptist Nixa dedicated to helping you memorize and meditate upon the Word of God. As we continue our memorization of Romans 8, we come this week to verse 30, which continues the golden chain of salvation begun in verse 29. So let's look at those two verses together. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now again, I want to state that these verses contain deep and glorious truths that simply cannot be fully unpacked in a 10-minute video. So um, once again, I'll refer you to the two sermons that I preached on this text two years ago uh, entitled, by grace, for glory, through groaning. Oops, throning is not the right way to put that. Let me go ahead and erase that. That's what happens when you try to combine through and groaning. You get throning, uh, which is not a word. All right, by grace, for glory, through groaning, right? And those were two sermons on Romans 8, 28 to 30. All right, today what I want to do is look at two issues that arise from these verses. First, let's define the five main terms in this golden chain of salvation. Uh, first is the word for new. Uh, now, as I argued last week, when referring to particular foreknowledge, right, those whom, uh, it is particular. When referring to particular foreknowledge of God, this must mean something more than the way this verse is commonly understood, which is that God knew ahead of time those who would believe the gospel. And on that basis, he then predestined them for salvation. Um, it must rather mean that God determined who would believe the gospel. In other words, that God foreknew who would be glorified means that God chose or determined who would be glorified. Foreknowledge, in other words, when applied to the particular foreknowledge of God, is virtually synonymous with election. Those whom he chose, he also predestined. Predestined, then, is the second term in this, uh, the second link in this golden chain of salvation. This refers to the destiny which God predetermined for those whom he foreknow, foreknew, rather, or those whom he chose. Uh, so if election refers to the selection of those who would be saved, the selection out of the mass of sinful humanity of those who would be saved, predestination refers to the direction or the course that God infallibly set the elect upon, namely conformity to the image of his son. That's what we are predestined to. So predestination refers to the direction or the destiny upon which God sets uh, these who are then chosen. All right, third, called, down in verse 30. Called refers to the effectual call. Now, this is not the general call of the gospel by which all men everywhere are commanded to repent and believe the free offer of the gospel. This is the effectual call by which God awakens some uh, who are dead in trespasses and sins. He awakens them to life and to faith in Christ. So I want you to note two truths about this calling. Okay, so two truths about this calling. Number one, it is... A particular call only those whom he predestined were called uh, only those whom he foreknew and predestined were called and secondly this is an effective or effectual call all those 
whom are who who are called are justified and glorified right those whom he called he also justified and glorified so here's where we get the idea of a particular call and here's where we get the idea of an effectual call um, this means that the call of God if only those who are foreknown and predestined are called and all those who are called are justified and glorified this means that the call of God is always effective it creates what it commands namely faith in Christ by which we are justified which is the fourth link in this chain justification refers to that change in legal status of those whom God foreknew and predestined and called uh, prior to justification sinners stand under the law as those who are found guilty and condemned to the law's curse which is eternal wrath after justification Sinners stand under the law as those who are found righteous and thereby recipients of the law's blessing. Now, how can that be? How can God justify the ungodly without forfeiting his own justice? Well, Romans 3, 25 and 26 give us the answer to that question. Um, in, in these verses, Paul says, whom God, and this whom is a reference to Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, an atoning, substitutionary sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. He hadn't punished sins that merited punishment. This was to show his righteousness at the present time. And this present time is a reference to the cross of Christ. At the cross, God demonstrated his righteousness so that he might be just, right, in the demonstration of his wrath against sin and the justifier in the demonstration of his mercy towards sinners of the one who has faith in Christ. Jesus Christ became our substitute under the law. And Jesus' perfect righteousness fulfilled the law's demands, thus meriting for us the law's blessing, which is eternal life. And Jesus' propitiatory death fulfilled the law's penalty, thus removing from us the law's curse of eternal wrath. So at the cross, our unrighteousness was imputed to Christ and was punished in him. And then through faith, his righteousness is imputed to us and we receive his blessing. So there's a change in legal status under the law, right? So under the law, we, we are sinners, right? And as sinners, we are deserving of the law's wrath and curse okay um, but Christ was righteous and as one who was righteous who always kept the law he was deserving of the laws uh, blessing and favor right so in justification there is a transfer that takes place right our unrighteousness is transferred to Christ and punished in him and his righteousness is transferred to us so that we receive the blessing that his righteousness deserved and he receives the curse and the wrath that our sins and unrighteousness deserved and on the basis of that exchange God then justifies us okay the last term glorified refers to the completion of our conformity to the image of his son right that is the the goal of our salvation it is the uh, glorification refers to the removal of our sin nature and the resurrection of our mortal 
body. Right? So glorification is the removal of our sin nature and the resurrection of our mortal body, such that we enter into the new heaven and the new earth with glorified bodies and glorified souls, prepared for everlasting joy and fellowship with God. So that's the first uh, issue that I wanted to raise from these verses. We defined these five terms for new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. The second issue uh, I want to deal with is the particular nature of this golden chain. I told you in last week's video that I would give you yet another reason why I think this golden chain of salvation rests upon the foundation of God's sovereign election rather than God's foreseeing of our willing response of faith. In other words, I, I told you I would give you another reason why foreknowledge means election, not that God looks ahead down the corridors of time and foresees those who will uh, willingly, freely choose him. And on that basis, then he predestines them to salvation. Um, in, in the minds of many, understanding foreknowledge as foreknowledge of our foreseen faith preserves the universality of God's saving love and, and the free will of man, which uh, in, in their view is essential to any true notion of love. And I gave three biblical theological reasons last week why foreknowledge cannot mean that God foresees our faith and predestines us on that basis. But verse 30 shows us a fourth reason. Uh, let's focus on this word called, right? Um, those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And note again that this calling is particular and it is effective. Those whom he predestined are also called. And those whom he called, he also justified and glorified. Now, if we just work backwards from glorification, we know that not everyone is going to be glorified. There will be some who are raised unto everlasting judgment and wrath. Well, if not everyone is glorified, then not everyone is justified. We further know that not everyone is justified. And if that's true, then not everyone is called. In other words, no matter how one understands the word foreknowledge at the beginning of verse 29, even if it were to mean that God foresees our faith, it doesn't mean that, but even if it were, this understanding of foreknowledge breaks down on the word called. Because clearly, only those who are called believe and are justified. And also, clearly, not everyone is called. The call creates what it commands, namely faith. The call creates faith. So, if God is looking ahead in human history and he is foreseeing our faith, and on that basis is predestining us for glorification, then the only faith, according to verse 30, the only faith that he foresees is a faith that he himself creates in the effectual call. You simply cannot escape the particular nature of God's saving purposes. And I wholeheartedly believe that if you understand the whole picture of God's redemptive purposes, you wouldn't want to escape the, the implications of his divine sovereignty. God's sovereign election and his effectual call into faith and salvation are the only hope of sinners. Without it, none would be saved. Well, as we close, let's say verses 29 and 30 together in order that we may inscribe it upon our minds. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called... And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified.